Radio TV Fono Nut here, and we have a 19-inch Sharp color TV from 1988. I think it's a model 19NP58. Uh, obviously, it's working right now. We've already repaired it, but it didn't always work. Now, just to give you a little history of this set, a couple of months ago, I was given this TV along with two other sets at an estate sale after they didn't sell. Gee, imagine that. Uh, the other two sets were a little 9-inch Panasonic color set, which we've already done a repair video on, and then the third set was a 27-inch Apex flat tube job from about 2001 that seems to work okay, and I have not pulled the back, and I don't plan on pulling the back. Now, this particular TV here, when I first obtained it, I fired it up, and it would produce a picture, but I could tell that the customer controls were very dirty, and the grayscale was a bit off, so not being very high on my priority list, I just turned it off and set it to the side until a few days ago, at which time I decided I would open, open it up and spruce it up a little bit and take care of anything that really needed to be done, but I didn't even bother to turn the TV on before doing so, because after all, it worked last time we turned it on, so I assumed it would still fire up. Well, you know the old saying about never assume anything, and that turned out to be true here. So watch the video, and you'll see, uh, you'll see what took place with this television. No, it didn't turn into be a, a, a money pit or an extreme time waster, but we will demonstrate in this video how sometimes electronic components can fail in mysterious ways, and they can fail quietly, as in work this, this time and not work the next time. Now, we're feeding this TV with a RCA digital converter box from 2014. I found this in the trash a few years ago uh, down the street. Uh, the lady that lived there, she was one of the last remaining neighbors of the quote-unquote old neighborhood, and when she passed away, they were throwing away a bunch of stuff, and I believe I got that converter box down there, but couldn't find the remote. Ended up having to order a remote off of eBay. There was a 19-inch Last Gasp Magnavox CRT Chinese television in the pile that I remember doing a video on that one. I had to give the green gun a love tap, and then I ended up giving it to a church for their rummage sale. And I think there was a cheapo DVD VCR combo that was junk that I ended up throwing away. And as far as this box, it, it works pretty good, but there's a couple of things I don't like about it. Number one, there is no button on the remote to adjust the aspect ratio. You have to go in the menu to do that. And right now I've got it, got it set to full screen, which the advantage of that is you don't see the black borders at the top and bottom, but the disadvantage is that part of the content gets cut off. Usually that's not a problem, but there are some cases when I want to see the full content, and for that it would be handy to have a button on the remote to instantly switch to, to another aspect ratio. Uh, another thing I don't like about this box is sometimes when changing channels or when the signal drops out and comes back, the picture will appear, but there will be no audio. And sometimes it'll take the audio up to like 30 seconds to pop back on. And a couple of times it hasn't popped on at all, and I'd have to turn the box off and turn it back on to get the audio to come back. So now, as far as what I'm going to do with this set, I don't know. I'm really not that attached to it. Over the past 10 or 12 years, I have gotten really good at saying no to these later CRT televisions. And when I say later, I mean stuff from the, I'll say the mid-1980s to the end of the CRT era because most of them just really don't do anything for me. There are a few exceptions within that time frame that I find interesting, but most of those sets from those years, they just 
they're just a plain Jane basic boring TV that just doesn't do anything for me but in the past few months I've gotten lax and started taking in these sets from various sources I think I got about 13 of them here now that range in size from 9 inch up to 27 inch but the problem is nobody wants them anymore it's just it's just very hard to get rid of these CRT televisions now yes the retro gamers want some of them for playing older video game consoles but in order for that to take place you have to live in an area where you actually have those kind of people in my area the economy sucks the population is not nearly as uh, high as it is in other areas of the country and most people around here don't have broad enough interest to be concerned with vintage video games or vinyl records or, or vintage electronics in general you know mostly what's left around here now uh, their main interest is uh, sitting on the porch and drinking beer and smoking weed and that's about the size of it and stuff like old video games and vintage electronics is not even on their radar so there you go so what will probably happen to this TV is it will end up being given away, thrown away or dropped off at a thrift store where it will probably eventually get thrown away this TV along with all the rest of them so I won't ramble on about any of that anymore uh, we'll just uh, get into the repair video and hopefully you'll learn something from this All right, one other sidebar before we get into the sharp repair video let's see how long it takes this relatively new smart Vizio 32 inch flat screen to produce a picture on a channel once we turn it on So there you go. And then to get that off of the side, we have to press the OK button. And then we can get down and push the arrow button to select what channel we want. And then click OK. And it'll tune to it. Uh, that's not really the channel I wanted. I meant to do... You see, this set doesn't even have a channel display when you use the up and down buttons to change channels. Okay, why is it not moving? All right, what's wrong with this thing? I remember how confusing the elderly got with TV back in the 90s. This would really confuse them. Okay, I finally got it on a channel that won't get us any kind of copyright BS, or at least I don't think it will, but what I was going to say was I remember back when people were getting away from vacuum tube-based TVs because they didn't want to wait 30 or 45 seconds for the TV to warm up, and today I find that quite comical that people were trying to get away from having to wait on the TV to come up, but now you these, these, these smart TVs... They don't come up instantly. As you saw, this one had to boot up before we uh, got a channel to come up on it. And with these newer sets, there's no numerical keypad on the remote. You can get a keypad up. You have to push this button. It says, watch free, I believe it says. And then a keypad comes up that goes away very quickly. And you have to use the up and down, left and right arrows to navigate to the number you wish to press. Like I said, this would this would really confuse the heck out of some of those senior citizens I knew back in the 90s. In fact, I used to say that 
they needed to continue to make rotary dial TVs for the senior citizens because the the push button digital sets often confused them. But uh, but to get off on another subject, it's stuff just like this here is the reason that it's very hard to get rid of a used television, whether it be flat screen or CRT. I got on the Walmart website. And you can still get this TV for like $129, and somebody told me if they were somewhere and saw a 50-some-odd-inch TV for like $249. So I think you know where I'm going with this. It's basically gotten to the point where anybody who wants a new television can get one. Now, 35 years ago, when an entry level 19 inch color set might have cost 250 or 300 dollars, uh, somebody might have been willing to buy a used television, even a used black and white television, who couldn't afford to buy a new TV just to have something to watch because a black and white TV is better than no TV. But now, with TVs being as cheap as they are and everybody having been conditioned, that you must constantly have the latest and the greatest, you can't have anything that's even remotely out of date, then you can forget about, you can just about forget about selling off a used television. In fact, the guy at the pawn shop told me that he will not even accept the TV if it's over two years old. And he said it also has to be a smart TV. He said if it's not a smart TV and or if it's over two years old, they won't buy them. They'll just, they'll just pretend like they're not even sitting there. And in today's world, I don't even know if you can buy a new television that isn't a smart TV. But from what I'm seeing today, you know, back when we were kids, we were all too happy to have a 12-inch black and white TV in our room. Nowadays, you've got parents that think their kids have to have a 50-inch smart TV hanging on the hanging on the bedroom wall in their kid's room, and that's just how things have changed over the years. And as far as this TV, you're probably wondering how I came into possession of it. Uh, a friend of mine gave it to me. Uh, his dad went in a nursing home earlier this year. And he bought this television for his dad to watch, and his dad was only in the nursing home about three months when he passed away. So my friend told me, he said, I've, I've got TVs, I don't have any need for this one, if you want it, you can have it. And he said, there's a couple of more larger flat screens in my dad's house, and if none of the family members want them, I'll bring those to you at some point. So I told him thank you, and I appreciate you thinking of me. Now, what I'm going to do with this set, I don't know either. Uh, but I appreciate him keeping me in mind. Now, all I've done to this TV is I went in the menu, and I turned the backlights way down. Uh, since that's the most common failure on these newer televisions is the backlights failing because they run them wide open. I went in and turned them way down to try to conserve their life. And if you have a modern flat screen TV, then I'd recommend you do the same thing. Yes, you'll lose some picture brightness, but you will you'll gain some life to your television. Now, if your TV doesn't have a dedicated setting to turn down the backlights, then maybe it has a power saver mode. If it has that, enable that, and that will usually dim the backlights down. But like I said, the backlights are usually the first thing to fail on these. Either they'll short or they'll open, or the phosphors will start turning blue, and that'll result in a blue picture. So, but getting back to these cheap TVs, when you have a television like this one that's only, what, $129 whenever it was bought, in order to sell one that cheap, you've got, they've got to skimp on quality. And that's the reason if you get three years out of one of these, you're doing good. Now, I can remember a time when $129, if you were lucky, would buy you an entry-level 19-inch Korean-made black-and-white set on sale. 
And that back then, that was considered a cheap junkie TV. But today, that cheap junkie TV from 1982 likely either still works or can be made to work without a lot of effort. I can promise you in 40 years this one will not be working and it most likely won't be able to make be able to you most likely won't be able to make it work without much effort so that's pretty much what we've come to with TVs cheap and disposable alright enough about that let's get on with the sharp TV repair oh and another thing real quickly about this TV the only inputs it has are two HDMI inputs and a USB port and I think it has an 8 inch audio output jack so no component or composite inputs for what's known as legacy devices on this. If you want to use those, you would have to get some kind of adapter to interface with the TV. Here's the inside of that set. Not all that dirty on the inside, so that tells us that it probably hasn't been used that much. So on the back, we have a 75 ohm coax input for VHF, and then we have our traditional two screws for 300 ohm twin lead for. UHF, of course, in today's world, UHF, or the fact that it's cable ready, is really not a concern. And all we really need is channels 3 and 4 on VHF. The only time UHF or cable ready capability would be a concern is if you got really industrious and had a whole house cable head in system, if you will, where you take the incoming broadcast, pick them up via a digital converter box and then feed the output of the converter box through modulators and then modulate the channels to whatever channel position you wish. Now, if you did something like that, and I've actually thought about doing that, it may do it one day, if you did something like that, then of course you would need your traditional VHF, UHF, and our cable capabilities because you'd be using a tuner in the set to select your desired channel but as far as most people on something like this all you would really need is channels 3 and 4. Now the tube is a sharp branded tube EIA 455 I don't know what that cross references to I don't know if Sharp was building their own tubes or if they outsourced the production of their tubes and just put their name on it. Now, judging by the looks of this board and the lack of dust, which leads to low hours, I really don't think this set's going to need a whole lot. Probably just a cleaning of the controls and if there happens to be any solder connections that look iffy, we'll fix those, but that's probably going to be about it. Alright, looking at the circuit board, uh, this area here, which is the power supply area, you can tell that's gotten hot, which is normal from use. So we'll probably just re-solder everything in that area. Uh, this area over here looks to have gotten a little warm. Uh, and on sharp sets, the main things I found loose connections on was the power relay, the horizontal drive transformer, the horizontal driver transistor, uh, flyback, horizontal output transistor, vertical IC, etc. So, and of course any power resistors. So we'll probably just hit all those things with a soldering iron and, and be done with it. I just sprayed the customer controls with uh, neutral, so that ought to take care of any intermittents those present. Uh, since we're working on a sharp set, I'll tell you a story about a a 25 inch sharp set that I had the pleasure of working on probably 20 years ago. It was about the same age as this set but it was a lower end model with a mechanical tuner. There was this guy in town that he butchered more TVs than he fixed. He was really a carryover from the vacuum tube era and he could change tubes and jump out bad capacitors and that sort of thing, but when it come to in-depth troubleshooting, he really wasn't that great. And when Solid State came along, he was just lost then. Well, somebody brought him one of that sharp TV 
because of an intermittent shutdown condition and he couldn't fix it so it ended up over here and when I took the back off of it there were probably no less than 50 little electrolytic capacitors that he had tack soldered across the bottom of the circuit board to try to cure the uh, intermittent shutdown problem. Well, I discovered that the intermittent shutdown problem wasn't a bad uh, wasn't a bad capacitor at all. It was a it was a very bad solder joint on the horizontal driver transistor. So I resoldered the driver transistor and removed the. Uh, 50 some odd capacitors that he had tacked across the bottom of the circuit board and the TV worked great. Alright, questionable connections resoldered. All of these power resistors, the uh, well everything in this area that you can tell has gotten hot. Horizontal drive transformer, horizontal drive transistor, horizontal output transistor, flyback, vertical output IC, the regulator SCR, the SCR driver IC, pretty much anything that's been known to cause problems. And now I'm checking ESR on key capacitors in this 100 microfarad capacitor down here by the relay that's located right there in the cook zone. On the ESR meter, as you can tell, it's reading wide open. I'm surprised the TV would even fire up. Here's a new 100 microfarad cap. You can see how it reads, zero ohms. So we'll go ahead and replace that now. And we have another one that's dead. A 10 microfarad, 160 volt, which looks to be the uh, filter for the standby power supply. That's what they would often do on some of these sets. You would have a high rectified DC voltage, and then they'd filter it and then drop it down through a resistor and then Zener regulate it to get our get your low voltage for the standby supply and once again I'm surprised the set would even fire up with this open now I haven't fired this up in probably a month or two I probably should have fired it up just before this video to see if it would still fire up here's a new 10 microfarad 250 volt cap and as you can see perfect ESR so it's not a meter fault it's no kind of trickery here it's just we have some dead caps in this standby filter it was very common for it to die because it was energized as long as the set was plugged in so and then we have these resistors that are in the uh, voltage that drop the voltage and of course those are hot as long as the set's plugged in so you're just getting parts that are getting cooked as long as the TV is receiving power. Alright, I checked all of the other key capacitors in the power supply, vertical circuit, a boost filter, that sort of thing. All of those checked fine. We just had these two dead ones in the standby power supply. So we're now about ready to uh, put the board back in the set and fire it up and see if it works. Oh, and that guy I told you about that butchered up that sharp set when all it had was a bad solder connection, another stunt he would pull, and I never understood this. When he was removing a board from a TV, instead of unplugging the wiring harness, he would just cut the wires up close to the harness, and then whenever he got ready to put it back together, he would just strip the wires and twist them back together, and that was that. And one time I inquired as to why he did that. I said, why do you do that? You know, all you've got to do is just unplug it. You don't have to cut the wires and then re-splice them. That's just creating a lot of uh, unnecessary work for yourself and creating a very sloppy repair. And he said, well, some of those plugs will fit in different holes. So, uh, holes, yeah, that was the term he used, I believe. But he said, yeah those plugs will sometimes fit in different spaces so it's just easier for me just to uh, cut the wires and just match the colors back up and I said have you ever heard of making a diagram of where things go you know they do make sharpie magic markers they make ink pens they make paper and stuff for such reason for just such things as that I don't know if he ever I don't know if it ever sunk in or not. 
but it got so that if, if I would not touch anything if I knew he had been in it. Alright, we're back together and I also re-soldered the pins on this CRT socket. A few of them looked a little crusty. And speaking of soldering, there was another sharp set, 25 inch I think. It was a bit newer than this one. That a lady picked up at the dump. That's back when we had the green boxes in the county for trash collection. And that used to be a treasure trove to find stuff, but you had to be quick because between the scrappers and the resellers, if anything of value got thrown away there, it wasn't going to last long. In fact, it was rumored that some of those folks were hiding in the bushes so they could see when something got thrown away. But anyway, this lady found a 25-inch black plastic crap shark TV there. And it was dead as a doornail. The only thing it would do, the relay would click, and that was it. And she found out about me from somebody and asked me to take a look at it for her. And all that was wrong with it was a bad solder connection on the relay contacts. You could tell where it had been arcing for some time, and then when the connection finally failed, then the TV would no longer fire up. So I re-soldered the relay, and... TV worked perfect and she was happy. Now generally what causes these solder problems is as I'm sure you know these boards are not hand soldered. They're soldered by the machine and they're often not soldered very well to begin with. And over years of constantly heating and cooling and heating and cooling from the set being turned on and off, over time those connections just break loose. And if it wasn't soldered very good to begin with, then that connection is going to fail sooner than some of the other ones might. So the best thing to do is just go through and re-solder everything by hand that looks questionable. And that will help ensure that your television or whatever is a lot more reliable. And now you get to see the front of the TV for the first time. So let's see if it goes or blows. Well, I guess it's not going to do anything. Okay, so now what? Alright, we're plugged in, meter connected, and let's see what we have on the plus side of this capacitor that I think is the standby filter. We have 63 volts, so we have something there. Alright, on the relay coil we have 25 volts. That seems good. So this is what happens. We have our 120 volts AC coming in to the input of this resistor here. And you can see we have our 120 volts. And then it goes down through that, to the other side of that resistor through this other resistor. And at the other end of this second series resistor we have 93 volts AC. And then we go down here to this uh, half wave rectifier here and then the other side of that rectifier we'll have our DC output which is if the meter will make contact 63 volts okay it appears this camera wants to go out of focus so let's try again it still wants to go out of focus that's better well it appears that this diode D1713, which looks to be a Zener, is shorted. But just to make sure, we're going to unsolder one end of it and make sure it's not the... It could be either the diode or something across it that's shorted. And of course, we need to get the diode out to be sure. And yes, it is indeed shorted. So we need to completely remove it, find out what it is, and try to replace it with something. Somewhere around here, I've got a Zener diode kit, but... It's one of those things that since I need it, I could, probably couldn't find it if my life depended on it. Uh, I got online and was going to see if I could find a free service manual for that TV so I could look and see what value that Zener diode is. Uh, yes, I could pull the diode and there's probably some markings on it that will tell me, but as small as that diode is, it would just be easier for me to be able to... Uh, 
get a service manual and just look in there and see what it is, but here's the problem. Some service manuals I found are free. Some of them uh, are not free, and this is a case of the latter, and I'm not spending 17.49 for a PDF service manual when the TV is probably not even worth that much, so we'll just have to do this the other way and pull the diode out of the set and see what and see what's uh and see what it is and try to find a replacement for it. And it's stuff just such as this right here is why back whenever I was a teenager and fixing up used TVs to sell that I never offered a warranty on a used television, even though I would have never intentionally sold someone a TV that I thought was going to be a dud, but the fact remains is electronic parts fail, and they often do so silently and unpredictably. So on that note, there's no way I could give a warranty on a TV that I sold for 50 bucks or less or even higher for that matter because like this TV when I first when I had it on a month or two ago it actually worked had a pretty decent picture just the pots were dirty well then today I pulled it out and opened it up without even turning it on first to see what it would do found two dead caps uh, resoldered a bunch of crap plugged it in hit the power button nothing happens and then we find this Zener diode shorted in the uh, standby power supply. It's like a TV repairman friend of mine. He had a long time ago, he had a big Magnavox 26 inch console. I think it had a C6 chassis in it. He turned it off one day to go to bed, turned it on the next morning, and it popped, and that was that. And he ended up having to replace the flyback and a bunch of other parts that it took out with it so and I remember one other story he told me he was doing TV repair work for this salvage company that got a lot of damaged TVs from Western Auto and other places damaged and defective TVs well they brought him this True Tone console it was built by Wells Gardner and I think it had an audio problem he fixed the audio problem they paid him then a week later it came back with a failed high voltage tripler and the owner of the salvage company refused to pay him for the repair on the grounds of, well, you had it last week, you should have known that was going to fail last week and went ahead and replaced it. And he tried to tell him, look, that tripler is a sealed unit. There's no way I can just look at it and tell that it's going to fail. Either it works or it don't work. And the guy said, well, that's all fine and good, but I'm still not going to pay you for it. And my friend said, well, okay, don't pay me, but I'll get it out of you one way or another. And my friend said, and I, over the years, I got it out of him. And I told my friend, I said, well, I believe if he'd have pulled that stunt on me, I'd have said, all right, well, then don't pay me and don't bring me any more uh, TVs to fix either. And my friend said, "Well, that gravy train was that gravy train was too good for me to uh, to uh, jump ship on that." So he said, "I continued fixing TVs for him until they quit fooling with TVs." But he said, "I did end up getting my money out of him in a roundabout way for that tripler repair that he refused to pay me for." All right, here is this little booger. Now let's get it in here and put it under some magnification and see if we can get any markings off of it. And I think this is going to be hard for me to see, even with magnification. Well, oddly enough, I took it out of the board completely and now it's testing just fine. I thought I had one terminal of it isolated from the trace. Apparently I didn't. So this diode may be good after all. All right, I'm reading seven ohms across this where this Zener diode would have gone. I give up. Uh, so that's just a lesson. You have to make sure the part is totally isolated from the circuit. Like I said, I thought it was, but 
apparently there was a tiny microscopic bit of solder that was causing it to make contact with that trace. It's like, for example, I've run into sets where the horizontal output transistor would appear to be shorted in circuit, and nine times out of ten, when they check shorted in circuit, they truly are shorted, but whenever you remove the part, it tests good, and the short ends up being, for example, the capacitor that connects between the collector and emitter of the uh, horizontal output transistor, which mimics a shorted transistor in circuit. Oh, well, it decided to behave that time. All right, so we have our rectified DC for the standby coming off of this capacitor, which I was measuring 60-something volts, which seems to be a bit low for something that's for a capacitor that's rated at 150. And it goes through here through this 2.2K ohm resistor where it's dropped, and then it connects to this Zener diode. And from this point to ground, we're reading basically a dead short. So something is shorted somewhere. Now to eliminate the possibility of something on this control cluster or these cables being shorted, since that's the only thing I messed with, I unplugged those so I could get the board up to where I could service it better. We're going to unplug each cable and see if our short is, has gone away, and if it has, then we know where to look. Alright, the short is still there with this cable disconnected, so let's unplug this cable. And the short is still there with that cable unplugged, 7.8 ohms. Alright, cable 3 has been unplugged, what do we have? We still have the short, so apparently it was nothing to do with uh, me filing up these plug connections or anything on this uh, control board cluster up here. And now what we'll need to do is trace this foil and see where else it leads and try to find the short. And since some of this foil is kind of hard to see, we might have to use the continuity beeper on my meter to find any connections that I'm that I'm uh, question. All right, we have the Zener diode back in place, and to facilitate ease of doing that, I just went ahead and removed this resistor. Got the diode back in and put the resistor back in place. Now, on that note, this is not really the best way to obtain a low standby voltage. Now, a lot of sets, what they would do is just use a simple step-down transformer to step the 120 volts AC down to, say, 24 volts or whatever, and then that's where they and then they would rectify and filter that voltage to drive the relay coil, and then there would be additional regulation to get it down to the five volts normally needed for the microprocessor and all that stuff. But doing it this way, that just creates a lot of excessive heat that really wouldn't be the case if they'd use a good quality. Uh, step down transformer. Alright, it goes through this jumper here up to this electrolytic, which as you can see, I uh, unsoldered the positive terminal of that to make sure that cap's not shorted. Uh, no, we don't have electrolytics dead short often, and this time is no exception, but we have had electrolytics short a few times in the past, so we need to try to trace this up and see where it goes. It looks like it goes all the way over to here, maybe. Yep, it does. So we trace it to one end of this resistor, and the short is still there. Let's move to the other end of the resistor. Okay, we get a much higher resistance rating, so we know we don't need to go in that direction. We need to continue to go this direction. And I can see the traces on this camera, or at least I think I can anyway, better than I'm seeing them looking at them direct, probably because we get some degree of magnification here. Okay, I traced our shorted line down through this coil and over to this electrolytic capacitor. 
unsoldered the positive terminal of that capacitor, and then the short went away. So that tells us this cap was shorted. But then whenever I check the capacitor, it does not sh doesn't show shorted. So maybe the heat from my soldering iron traveled up through the capacitor and somehow cleared the short. But that cap's going to get changed. All right, that cap was a 33 microfarad 16 volt. I was out of 33, so I used a 47. I don't think that'll matter because it's just a bypass capacitor, and our short is now gone away. We're reading over 28, 30k and rising, so that's about what I would expect to see. So we'll now put the chassis back in the set and see if it'll come to life for us. And here's the capacitor and like I previously indicated what I think happened is this capacitor was shorted and then whenever I desoldered one end of it to isolate the capacitor to make sure it was the capacitor and not something else then our heat uh, caused the short to clear but we went ahead and replaced that capacitor anyway so now let's put the chassis back in the cabinet connect everything up and see what happens alright now let's see if it goes or blows it went and we have high voltage and we have a channel display and we have a raster on the screen so now we need to get our converter box and antenna and see if we have a picture all right, box is connected. We have a picture. Happening on the other side of the world. First caution. Scripps News. Cambridge. Look at our controls under here. Federal Reserve Chair Jerome Powell is still not guess. satisfied with it where inflation is at in the United States. He says it's still too high and warned more interest rate hikes are still possible. Yeah. While acknowledging inflation has cooled down from last year, picture. Powell added bringing inflation down to the Fed's 2% target level will likely still require a slower yeah, growth this has got a, an economy. Got a pretty fair picture on it. Fed officials predicted at least one more interest rate hike before 2024. His comments come as the number of Americans filing new claims for unemployment benefits last week was lower than expected. Oh, Mike, you're in the all right, you can't turn the color all the way down on this, so I just tuned it to a black and white picture to adjust the adjust the uh, grayscale. So let's turn the uh, picture down till we get a fairly dim picture and then we're going to adjust the screen controls until we get a black and white picture here. That's kind of got a slight, not too bad, but it looks to have a, a slight red push. Maybe a little green there too. I'm going to turn the blue up a little bit. That got us more black and white looking. Now we'll turn the brightness and the contrast up and then adjust our drive controls to get rid of any shading, which that looks pretty good and like it is. But I'll tweak it just to get it as best I can. All right, that's a pretty good black and white picture all the way down and all the way up. So I think we're just going to leave it at that. Alright, we're looking pretty good now. I think we're about ready to put the back back on this. Now this picture tube, this is one of those with a very small neck. Uh, I believe the B&K socket number is 31 for the 467 and later testers. I've got some of those testers here, but I couldn't put my hands on one if my life depended on it, and my CR70 is out of commission at the moment, so I can't exactly test this tube to see what kind of shape it's in, but after adjusting everything, it's, it's very much so watchable, so that's all we need. Alright, it's another day, and the television's still working fine, and before we end this video, I thought I would show you on paper a simplified circuit with the uh, standby power supply and show you how we trace the circuit out for those who may not have been able to follow me along during the video. So looking here, we have our we have our 120 volts AC from the wall socket coming in here, and then we go through these two resistors in series to drop that voltage down, and then we go through a half-wave rectifier, and then we have our filter capacitor here, 
And then I believe, didn't we have another resistor off of that filter capacitor? And, and then we have this Zener diode regulator here. And then after that Zener diode, we have another filter capacitor. And then we go through a coil here. And then on the other side of that coil, we have another capacitor to ground. And then we have our standby voltage here for the microprocessor. And I think this probably goes to another regulator IC, but we won't concern ourselves with that. So, once we replaced the two dried out capacitors, we discovered the television was dead. And whenever I tested, and whenever I tested across this Zener diode, I noticed a near short, about 7 ohms or so, which is way too low. So I first thought was this Zener diode was shorted. So I lifted one end of the diode from the circuit and discovered that was not the case. So, okay, the diode's good, so put it back in circuit. Alright, could it be this capacitor here? Uh, so we pulled that out of the circuit and tested it. And it was okay. And let me add another couple of things to this little diagram here that were present that I forgot. To. So our short was still here, but going down we had a resistor going off to somewhere, so I placed my meter on the other side of the resistor, and the resistance was higher. So that tells us we're going in the wrong direction. We need to go back in this direction. So we go through this coil here, which reads a few ohms. That, that's what accounts for our 7 ohms, which I'll explain in a minute. Then on the other side of this coil, we have another capacitor. And whenever I tested across that in circuit, we had a dead short. So is it this capacitor shorted, or is it something else further on out that's shorted? So I unsoldered one end of the capacitor and lifted it from the circuit made another ohm meter check from our voltage line to ground and the short went away. So that tells us this capacitor was shorted. Then I tested the capacitor out of circuit and it also was not shorted. So like I said previously what I think happened was this capacitor was shorted and then the heat from my soldering iron that was needed to unsolder one leg of the part got the component hot enough to somehow clear whatever was shorted so then we just went ahead and replaced that capacitor a 33 microfarad 16 volt and like I said I was out of 33 so I just stuck a 47 in there which in that application should be fine no problems so now we have a a working 19 inch sharp TV from 1988 now what I'm going to do with it, I don't know. I'll, most likely, it'll probably get stashed here for a time, for the time being, and then I'll probably end up, probably end up giving it away at some point. And that's why I said earlier in this video that I'm just not gonna, I'm just not gonna get carried away with spending a lot of time or money on these because I know I'd never get it back. So. What's the point? Alf on TV. I remember that show from back in the 80s. Now, now this Linatron branding, that was that was Sharp's branding for sets with an inline tube. I guess they were trying to sound like Sony with Trinitron, but I really don't see anything different about the tube used in this set and the tube used in any other set from the time this was made, so that was just a marketing term, just to try to make it sound like a, make it sound fancy like Trinitron, but this tube, as far as I can tell, is just a, just your typical black matrix inline gun tube, nothing different about it, so there you go, but still a decent TV. Alright, just to give you an update on what happened to the Sharp, it is no longer in my possession, and over about the past 10 or 12 years, I'd gotten pretty good at saying no to these later model CRT televisions. And when I say later model, I'm talking about stuff from the 
late 80s until the end of CRT televisions, but for some some reason or another, I got caught up in dragging some of these home again over the past few months and ended up with about 12 or 13 of them all together. I guess I, I must have got, got caught up in all of this retro gaming crap that I keep hearing, and I, I had some delusions that somebody might actually buy some of them for that reason, but then again, things haven't changed a whole lot in my county, so uh, so I scratched that. So what happened was, I ended up putting several of them for sale on Facebook Marketplace and on probably 30-something other local for sale pages on Facebook, got no legitimate replies whatsoever, and by the way, the prices weren't very much, uh, about what a meal at McDonald's would have cost, and I'm one of those guys that when I put something up for sale, I put it up for sale because I want it gone, and I want it gone now, not six weeks or not six months from now, if I wanted to look at it, I'd just keep the thing here, but after I got no legitimate replies from the ad I put up, I took the ad down and decided to try to uh, give the sets to various people, and the excuses I heard were, oh, well, it, I don't, nobody wants that big bulky crap anymore, or I can't pick up anything on it without a converter box, or, and this is the good one, well, I'd love to have one to play my old video games on, but my wife won't let me have it. And that's a that's a rant for a whole nother day. I won't go off on that today, but so we had no luck selling them. We had no luck giving them away. So where does that leave us? So I called the garbage company and told them that I had some TVs I wanted to dispose of. And she said, put them out. We'll send the bulky waste truck by. So I put four televisions out. A 27-inch Apex with a flat tube, a 24-inch Dynaflat Samsung. It was a nicer set that had component and composite video inputs. It's one I picked up by a dumpster, and it worked fine. I doubt it works fine now. The third set was that 20-inch RCA that we did the tuner connections on, and that was a stereo set with composite inputs. And then the final set was a 19-inch Samsung with mono audio and composite input. That's the one that we, uh, uh, let me should say, I broke the circuit board on because I was being careless. And I should have just thrown it away right then, but I did not patched it back up. So all four of those sets went to the street. I put them out the day before the truck ran. I didn't cut the cords off or do anything because I was hoping somebody might see them and grab them, but that didn't happen. So the garbage truck devoured them Thursday morning. Well, then I had three other TVs I wanted to get rid of, a 25-inch Sanyo and a 19-inch Sanyo and this Sharp set here. And the two Sanyos, the RCA and the Samsung that got crushed, those those were the four that came from that church, from that uh, Baptist church after they couldn't sell them in their rummage sale. They were technically free, but I ended up giving the church 20 bucks just to, just to try to help them out. So anyway... My friend came to town yesterday, and we decided to uh, load the, t the three TVs up in his vehicle and take them to the thrift store. Thrift store number one refused them. He said, I can sell one once in a blue moon, but they don't bring much money, and I've got about 15 or 20 of them back there now. So he didn't want them. Thrift, sn thrift store number two, they didn't want them, and she went so far as to say, there's actually a TV sitting out on the sidewalk by the trash compactor right now, and it's been sitting out there a week, and nobody's even looked at it. Well, I went to look at it, and it was a 19-inch Emerson from the early 2000s, made by Funai. Looked to be in really nice shape, probably worked, but I did not grab it. Because, let's face it, I had three I was trying to get rid of. And it would have been kind of foolish for me to grab another one that was that new. And besides, I'd have caught all kind of flack from my friend. 
and he'd have told me, yeah, you, you, you're trying to get rid of three of them that nobody wants, and here you are grabbing another one. Now, I will say this, had it been something like a Zenith four-tube hybrid or a truly vintage television, that TV would have gotten loaded up, and he could have he could have raised all the cane he wanted to. So we left there and went to the uh, the music store, which they have a lot of gamers that hang out down there. And I asked them, "Do y'all want a couple of uh, you want some color TVs, old school type?" No, we don't want nothing like that. Well, then finally we went to the church that has those rummage sales fairly often, and I'd had a falling out with them because it got so that. They couldn't do anything without calling the preacher first, and when they were wanting twenty dollars for a DVD player that should have been five bucks, that's when I washed my hands of them. But I said, "Well, I want to get rid of these things, so I will go by there and ask them." So she said, "Let me call the preacher," and I'm thinking, "Yeah, y'all really can't fart without calling him first. So she called him, and he gave her the green light, so they took the three televisions, and I asked, uh, if I get any more, do y'all want them? She said, all I can tell you is just bring them down here, I'll make a phone call, and if they say yes, then we'll take them. So then we left there and went to the Salvation Army to see if they had any new music or anything like that. They didn't have nothing, but there was a big truck parked out front loading up garbage and I saw two later model CRT televisions on the truck and I asked the guy about them and he said yeah they work but nobody buys them nobody wants them and I believe he said the landfill charges them forty dollars to uh, dump dump a load so basically what they're doing is, is paying the haul off somebody else's garbage is what it what it boils down to. So with that said, I think I'm about done with the black plastic and silver plastic crap TVs unless it's something that has a smaller screen, say 13 or 19 inch, and is new enough to have a digital tuner built in. And I might consider taking some of the smaller ones that have a VCR and or a DVD player built in if they're in decent shape and I can get them for practically nothing but other than that it's just really stupid for me to drag these things home and then fix them and then end up throwing them away that that's just very stupid and unproductive so we're just going to have to stop that when we left the Salvation Army I had some fun with my friend tried to get him to take me to go back and get that TV off the sidewalk and I got an earful there, and I'm like, "Hey, I don't want that TV. I'm just, I'm just pulling your chain." Well, after I got through pulling my friend's leg about going back and getting that TV, then he got off on. I, well, I just can't understand why it's so hard to give away a working television set. Back whenever I was growing up, and by the way, he was raised by his grandparents who did not have a lot of money and. And and he told me back whenever I was growing up, had somebody offered my grandfather a free television that worked, it wouldn't have mattered to him how old it was. He would have taken it. I said, well, back then, I think that was probably the mindset of most people. But in today's world, it's it's a completely different ball game. I said, today, most people have been conditioned that you must have the biggest and the best you can't be seen with last year's model you must constantly upgrade and i mean let's face it it's like a like a uh, somebody i know that used to run a thrift store to help to finance a homeless shelter that they ran her husband told me one time and he was very very correct in saying this he said they could not have two nickels to rub together but somehow there's two things they're going to come up with that smartphone and that big TV hanging on the wall with a with the premium cable or satellite package attached to it, and you know I couldn't argue with him because he's telling the truth. So, so yeah, my friend and I got in a discussion about all of that, and I said people today are just not willing to settle. 
They want high definition. They want streaming. They want smart TVs, and and that's the way that goes. And I said, and the fact that you can go to Walmart and buy a 42-inch TV for what $229 don't help things either. I said it's about gotten to the point where anybody who desires a television can somehow manage to get a new one if they want one. It don't matter that it's a Chinese piece of crap. It's probably going to die in two or three years. It, it's like I've been told before when I would tell people, but yeah, those old TVs, they would hold up. And I would usually hear, well, people don't care about that anymore. That That's not a, that's not a factor anymore. They buy a TV, if it lasts them two or three years and breaks, then they're happy with it. And by that time, they're ready to upgrade anyway. But as far as what TVs I kept, for now, for this minute anyway, I still have that 27-inch Toshiba with the digital tuner in it. And that's really the only reason I hung on to that one. I've got the 13-inch Sylvania that we did a video on a while back, and I've got a 13-inch Panasonic from 2003. I don't think you've ever seen that one. The main reason I hung on to those two is because they're small, don't take up much room, and they have composite input jacks on them, which makes them handy for testing out DVD players and such things as that. And I kept that little white 9-inch Panasonic that we did the video on. Even though it only has RF input, I decided to hang on to it for a little while. And then the TV that I watch every day is a 20-inch Sharp from 1996 that I got from a friend earlier this year who was having a moving sale. I mainly keep that one because it has the uh, composite input jacks on it that I can connect the DVD player to without need for a modulator. And then in my bedroom, I have that little 13-inch Dura brand that I got at an, at an estate sale earlier this year. Uh, the main reason I keep it is because it has a digital tuner in it, so there you go. But like I said earlier, there's probably not going to be that many more uh, later CRT televisions. Oh, and I have that 19-inch Zenith from, what is it, 1994 or 95 in my kitchen, the one that has a dying tube. I just use it to listen to the news on, and I just keep it around just to see how long that tube will last before it just goes completely belly up. And then whenever it goes dead... I'll probably just hit it with the rejuvenator one more time or wrap a turn of wire around the flyback cord to boost the filament voltage and dump it off at the church if they'll take it. But like I said, there's, there's, there's just no need in bringing these things home and fixing them, even if I don't have to spend much money on them. There's just no need in bringing them home and fixing them and then, and then turning around and either giving them away, which I really don't mind so bad, because at least hopefully somebody's getting use out of them, but throwing away something that works perfectly goes against everything I believe in, but uh, when, you can't, when you can't sell them and you can't really find anybody to take them for free, then, and when you have no room to stash them, then what other choice do you have? So, enough about that. Hopefully the Sharp will end up going somewhere where somebody will use it, but I've got my doubts. I figure it'll sit at the church until they get tired of looking at it, and then they'll throw it in a dumpster, but that'll be on them. But I hope you got something out of all of this, and uh, more to come later. Oh, and one other thought. You'd be surprised how many people I run into who either think that there is no over-the-air TV anymore and that your only way to receive television is to subscribe to some sort of pay TV service, and then you actually have people who think that they can connect an antenna directly to an older TV and pick up something on it, and then you have people that know that there are digital broadcast today, but they don't know that you can get a converter box to connect between the antenna and your old television.
In fact, there's been a few people in the area that once I told them that you can get an antenna and get about 25 stations, then they dumped their cable or satellite subscription and got an antenna. And then there's been other people, based on somebody I know that witnessed this at a thrift store, they'd buy an older television for five or ten bucks, take it home and connect an antenna to it, and then when they couldn't pick up anything on it, then they went back to the thrift store and, and went all ghetto on them and, and demanded a refund and threatened to come back down there and kick some butt if I, they didn't give it to them. And even back when they were transitioning to digital and running PSAs on TV every five seconds, there were still people who didn't get it. There was an elderly lady that I know who had a black and white TV in her kitchen and I think one of the local stations turned their signal off a little early, and she called me up thinking something was wrong with her TV, so I went over there, or she came and got me and carried me to her house, I should say, and I looked at the TV, and I said, Miss Davis, there's nothing wrong with your TV. It's just analog broadcasting is going away, and, uh, and Channel 24 turned their signal off a little early. I said, you can get a converter box to keep using this TV, but she said, how much does that cost? And I told her how she could get a box, and she said, I'm not going to all that trouble for a little black and white TV, so you just take it with you when you leave. And I said, well, you sure you don't want to keep it for a couple of more weeks until the other channels turn their signal off? And she said, no, just take it and get it out of here. So I did, but the point I'm making was, even though they were running all these PSAs about analog going away and converter boxes being needed for older TVs, it, it just still went off of a lot of people's radar. They just didn't, they just didn't get it. And even when, it, and even when the full shutdown happened, people still didn't get it. They wondered why they couldn't pick up anything.